Well, first of all, thank you very much for coming. Bonjour et bienvenue to our Canadian visitors. That's the extent of my French, despite the fact that I grew up in a half French Canadian family and spent three years in a French parochial school. So that's all the French you'll hear. We've spent quite a bit of time putting the parade together, but before we can do the parade, you have to understand how this place started. Why in the world is the largest museum of its kind in the world in Kennebunkport, Maine? Well, in order to understand it, we need a trolley car. So let's wait for a trolley car. Anybody in the crowd today born in or now live in Biddeford, Saco, or Old Orchard Beach? Okay. We're going to take you back to 1939. At that time in the United States, a lot of trolley lines were disappearing. They were either being put out of business by the popularity of the automobile, or they were converting to buses. The local trolley line in Biddeford was the Biddeford and Saco Railroad, and this was one of its trolleys that I'll tell you more about in a moment. This was a very popular line for trolley enthusiasts like us for a lot of reasons, but one of the big reasons was the fact that they ran open cars out to Old Orchard Beach and that the fact that the fare was five cents, that didn't hurt either. 1939, the company announced that it was changing to buses and the trolleys were going to be retired. July 5th would be the last day for the trolleys. A group of men, most of them from the Boston area, got a wild idea of buying one of the old cars and saving it. They didn't have an idea about building a museum, they just wanted to save one of their favorite trolley cars. And they approached the management of the Biddeford and Sacco, the gentleman's name was Burton Stride, and asked him what it would cost to buy the trolley. And they were told $300, which was the scrap price of the car. They had been promised to a junk dealer. $300 in 1939, probably you might have said $3 million. It was way beyond their means. So they tried again a little bit later on and talked to Mr. Stride again. This time they found Mr. Stride at home mowing his lawn. And it seems that after one of the enthusiasts mowed the lawn for him, the price dropped to $150. I'm going to put my book down here for just a moment because I made a photocopy of something that I have to read from. This says, received of petty cash. Date, July 5, 1939. Amount, $108 for deposit on open car number 31. Charge to J.B. Stride, of the Biddeford and Saco Railroad. And a couple of weeks later, on July 14th, I received a petty cash for $42 for the balance of car 31. So by mid-July, these guys had themselves a trolley car, and they had themselves a big problem. The Biddeford and Saco had made a very public promise that there would be no derelict trolley cars sitting around the city. They had to get the car out of town. The story is too complex, but it boils down to this. They were told that there was a farmer in Kenny Bunkport who might have a piece of land that they could rent. So they went to check it out. The farmer did have a piece of land. It was a little triangle that had been cut off from the rest of his farm many years before by the building of the Atlantic Shoreline trolley line between Kenny Bunkport and Biddeford. The trolley line that came right through where that trolley bus is parked. The farmer agreed to rent the land. That's approximately where our front entrance is now. They moved the car down here. It looked a lot worse back then. But that's what started this place. A handful of guys who got themselves a trolley car and needed to put it someplace. There was no search committee, design committee, this would be a great place to put a museum. We're kind of here by happenstance. A year later, Manchester, New Hampshire stopped running its trolleys. One of those came here. 
the war kind of intervened, but after World War II, more trolleys were taken out of service, more of them came here, the organization built, and on we went. To this day, there are still some very well-meaning people who live locally who honestly believe that up that driveway are a handful of derelict old railroad cars that a few guys come up with and play with on the weekends. Little do they realize that up that driveway, the men and women of the Seashore Trolley Museum have built a collection of over 250 transit vehicles from all over the United States and all over the world. Our shop crew is regularly consulted by other museums on projects that they're doing. In the operating department, the methods we've used to teach operations and run the railroad has been copied by many other museums. We are looked upon as one of the preeminent transportation museums in the world. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how we ended up here in Kennebunkport and Arundel in 1939. Now, about the car. Number 31 was built in 1900 by the J.G. Brill Company in Philadelphia, one of the biggest makers of trolley cars and other railroad equipment. A lot of trolley companies got rid of these cars because they were seasonal. It got expensive. But the Biddeford and Sacco kept theirs right on right up until the end. And this was restored back in the 1970s. Which brings us to the end of the story. Right about there at the museum's 35th or 40th anniversary, I'm forgetting now. Some of the original founders were still alive. They stood on this car. The son of Mr. Stride from the Biddeford and Sacco was there, and he handed us a canvas bag containing 3,000 nickels. <laughs> Do the math. What's that? $150. So we were paid back the money that we had paid for the car. Of course, we had to put a few million more nickels into its restoration. But that is the story of car 31 and the founding of the Seashore Trolley Museum. Our motorman, Dan Howard, is from New York State, originally from Massachusetts. Our conductor, Bill Crawford, is also from Massachusetts, two of the many volunteers that we'll see this afternoon. So, ladies and gentlemen, to start the parade, as it always does, from Biddeford, Saco, and Old Orchard Beach, Maine, Car number 31. They were known as breezers. They made their own breeze as they came along. Now, an example of how practical Mainers can be. Those of you that live in or vacation in this part of Maine, you're looking at the reason why trolleys came to this part of the state originally. Not because somebody had some great idea of carrying people, say, between Sanford and Kennebunk, but because of industry. There were large textile mills in the now city of Sanford. The buildings are still there. The mills are long closed. But the mills had a problem. They needed to get their finished goods to market and their raw materials in using the nation's railroads. But the nearest train connection, the nearest railroad connection, was two miles away from the mills. And the railroad would not build a spur to the mills. So the mill owners did their homework, developed a group of investors, and they built themselves a trolley line between the mills in Sanford and Sanford's village of Springvale, where the railroad went through. Now they could bring the freight cars directly from the railroad to the mills and vice versa without having to haul everything by wagon back and forth. That cut their costs. Now some of those mill workers realized they didn't have to live in the tenement houses next to the mills. They could ride some of the passenger trolleys in from Springvale. Now they could live outside of, of Sanford, away from the mill. When that worked for them, this company did another thing. They built another trolley line from Sanford through Kennebunk to Cape Porpoise. At that time, the mills were using thousands of tons of coal every year. And the cheapest way to buy coal was by the shipload. 
So the trolley company had its own dock and transfer facility at Cape Corpus so they could unload whole shiploads of coal and then use locomotives like this to haul the coal into Sanford. Oh, by the way, they built a casino at Cape Porpoise, not a gambling place, but a big building that sat right out on the water with porches and you could enjoy the ocean breezes or have uh, a wonderful shore dinner or listen to a dance band at night. And you took the trolley there, it brought you right to your door. So yeah, they went via industry to get the coal from Cape Porpoise, but now those hot, sweaty mill workers in Sanford could hop on a trolley car and in an hour or so be enjoying themselves out at the ocean and enjoying the cool breezes. The whole idea of day tripping had developed. But this is where it started. This is locomotive number 100. It was built in 1906 by the Laconia Car Company, another big builder of railroad and transit equipment in Laconia, New Hampshire. They call these a cab on a raft. And if you look at it, that's really all it is. It's a flat car with cab. Chuck Griffith from the Boston area is our motorman. And we got several folks inside. You can have a party in there that's such a big, a big uh, cab. They would use this to shift the cars again from the mills to, to the trains and go out to get the coal. We were successful in obtaining a locally administered federal grant and this car, which did not look this nice, underwent a total restoration in our shop. Randy LeClaire is our shop foreman. How long was this in the shop? Uh, two years and nine months. Two years and nine months. $140,000. $8,000 man hours, all right. They also did a lot of detective work on the, the paint of the car. This is the only car in our collection I know that's chocolate brown. It looks like a rolling Hershey bar. But you see the way it would have looked when it was doing its work. And this survived until 1949 and is believed to have been the last, if not one of the last, trolleys to operate in the state of Maine. So ladies and gentlemen, from Sanford and its environs, locomotive number 100. Got it. By the way, the Atlantic Shoreline's line came in about where you came in our front entrance today and went north to Biddeford, and that's what some of our track is built on. All right, we have trolleys that did more than just carry people. <clears throat> this is car number 108, and I have to explain the lettering. P, D, and Y, Portsmouth, Dover, New Hampshire, and York, Maine Street Railway. In reality, they never, the trolleys never ran to Portsmouth. There were no bridges back then, so the trolley brought you to Kittery, and you took a ferry boat across the Piscataqua River to downtown Portsmouth, and you could take other trolleys from there. But this line serviced basically Dover, New Hampshire, over into southern Maine, and this was a railway post office car. This carried the mail between Kittery up through York Beach and all of the post offices in between. This was, in effect, a rolling post office, okay? So if I, if a car was in my town and I had a postcard that I wanted to mail, I could hand it up to the mail clerk, he would stamp it, and whoever got, whoever the recipient was, it would say RPO on the stamp, Railway Post Office. So this was really a rolling post office. In its later days, it was converted into a car to work on the overhead wire and finished out its days in Sanford along with locomotive number 100. But we've restored it back to the way it looked when it was a railway post office car. Matt Cosgrove is our motorman today. Matt is also our webmaster. If you ever watch, look at our website, trolleymuseum.org. Steve Cappers, who is our mail clerk, is one of our newest operators. We do a basic training course every year for operators, and he's in that program right now, but volunteered to handle the mail today. So ladies and gentlemen, from Southern Maine and Southern New Hampshire, car number 108. By the way, if any of you come to our pumpkin patch event in the fall, 
This is the car that carries the pumpkins back in from the pumpkin patch. See the mailbox, the letter slot in the back end of the car? You could walk up and drop a letter right in there if the car was in your town. Anybody from Boston or the immediate Boston area? I would certainly hope so. Okay. This is car 5821. Boston had a very complicated way of identifying their series of trolley cars. There were oh, type 1s, type 2s, type 3s, type 4. This is a type 5. There were 471 of these built. I'll tell you why that number is important in a minute. But this is a product of the 1920s when all they were concerned about was getting people from one place to another. This has absolutely wonderful hickory upholstery. Okay. The inside walls of the car are the outside walls of the car. All right. But they could pack a lot of people in. It wasn't comfortable, but they were reliable cars. That number, 471, remained constant for years. They didn't lose any. And these cars were in service right up until the late 1950s. We have two of them. This one is here. If you're ever in the Boston Green Line subway and you stop at Boylston Street Station, you'll see the other car, number 5734, which has been on loan to the MBTA for many, many years. And that stays in Boston. But this is the one that comes here. Now, do we have a problem? Oh, okay, so the power station went off. Okay. I shall explain. Unlike you at home, who get a bill from the power company that says, you know, use so many kilowatt hours times whatever the rate was, that's your bill. We're an industrial customer. So not only are we billed for the amount we use, we also are billed for the demand we make for power. Our use is monitored in 15-minute increments, and we get extra charges on our bill. So our power station is set up that if we have too much stuff going and it might accidentally jack up the power bill, the circuit breaker trips out, and we avoid that problem. So something happened, and that, um, that caused the power station to trip out. Now watch what John's doing. He's putting the pole back up on the wire. There's 600 volts DC in the wire. The pole brings the power into the car, and then it returns through one of the rails. That's the circuit. So it's like a battery. You have a definite positive and a definite negative. So anywho, this is the Type 5. It's a very popular car. Gail Harji, who's our motor person today, is from New Jersey. John Grady. We still want to call you Mr. Grady occasionally. He had a long career in education from New Hampshire, another of our two volunteers. Ladies and gentlemen, from the Boston area, car number 5821. And while it's moving, those of you that live down there, these could be found all over the greater Boston area. Um, Malden and Everett on the north side, in the city, a little bit on the south side. They were all over the Boston systems. Anybody from Connecticut in the crowd today? All right, keep your hands up if you're from the New Haven area or reasonably close. All right. Here comes one of our more recent restoration projects. This is number 1160. This is 196 vintage. And this car had two lives, both of which involved carrying people. Its first life, and that's the way it's set up now, it carried people like you and me to work, to school, to wherever. But in its later years, it was used to haul workmen from job site to job site on the trolley line, and they could put tools and equipment on the inside. You can't see it, but this has only two seats, one long bench under each window, well, each side of the car. That leaves a very big middle aisle for people to ride standing up. But the passengers had a nickname for cars like this, because it reminded them of a particular sport. Big, long aisle. What do you think the sport was? Bowling. bowling. They called them bowling alley cars because there's a whole big 
center aisle. And you could pack a lot of people on here. This was the product of a more than 20-year restoration project here at the Trolley Museum. It did not look this nice when they started, that's for sure. Our crew today, Mel True is the motorman. Dick Cosgrove, who's one of my cohorts on the Saturday crew from Nashua, New Hampshire. They're our crew today. Thank you, gentlemen. And ladies and gentlemen, from New Haven, number 1160. Let's see how successful we are in this. Anybody from our nation's capital in the audience today? Washington, D.C. Okay. All right. This is also a recent restoration project. And I'll explain the unusual colors in a minute. This is car 1304 from Washington, D.C. It is what's known as a PCC car, President's Conference Committee. You know that old adage about don't trust anything designed by a committee? This blows that right out of the water. These cars, this type of car, were designed from the late 1920s into the early 30s. They were built from the mid-30s to the early 1950s. They are still running every day in Boston, San Francisco, Philadelphia, and in some of the tourist and heritage lines as well. They were made well, and they kept going. Washington, D.C., unfortunately, did in their trolley system in 1962. This car then went from D.C. to Erie, uh, to New York State, I'm sorry, for uh, General Electric for as a test vehicle, and then it came here. <laughs> now we have to talk about the United States Congress. <clears throat> When Congress allowed trolleys to be put in the nation's capital, they made one stipulation. They didn't want the overhead wires. There shouldn't be wires hanging over the streets of Washington, D.C. How are you supposed to run the car with no wire? Well, this is how they did it. You took, if you're coming in from the suburbs, they'd have the pole up like you see it. They'd get to a place along the way with a pit in between the tracks. You know, you go to Jiffy Lube and a guy gets down under your car to drain the oil. Well, they'd have a little pit. This thing's called a plow. This would attach to the back truck of the car. And these two contact points would drop down into a slot in the middle of the street. Kind of looked like where San Francisco cable cars have the slot in the street where the cable is. This slot had the electricity down in the street. And the plowman, as he was known, in that pit, would attach this to the car. They'd pull down the pole, and they'd do the rest of their run into the heart of D.C. using the plow. When they came out, they'd reverse the process. The guy would go into the pit, take the plow off, they'd put the pole back up, and on they would go. Thank you. That, that's a heavy object. The car, by the way, is from 1941. I didn't mention that. And Roger Tobin, our operator of the car today, who is also our assistant uh, manager of operations, did this for a living. He was an operator in Boston and went on to, uh, to become a, uh, an instructor on the MBTA. So ladies and gentlemen, from our, oh, I have forgot, the paint job. Toward the end of trolleys in DC, the trolley line, which was privately owned, came under the ownership of a gentleman who also owned an airline, Trans-Caribbean Airways. Okay, So it kind of has that islandy feel, the, the tropical colors and all. He decided to use the colors of his airline on the trolley cars. So you wouldn't kind of expect this in the nation's capital, but he went with it. So ladies and gentlemen, from Washington, D.C., car number 1304.
Anybody in the crowd from the Milwaukee area? How about Chicago? Okay. Because this will handle both of those cities. Back in the day, there were three major, what we would call, interurban lines that ran out of Chicago to various places. The one that survives today leaves Chicago, goes south, and then east to South Bend, the South Shore Line. Another line went west from Chicago to the then growing cities of Aurora and Elgin. The other left Chicago and went north to Milwaukee, the Chicago, North Shore, and Milwaukee Railroad, or the North Shore Line. They had the right, the, the permissions, to use the famous loop in downtown Chicago, which is an elevated transit line. So you could get on this car in downtown Milwaukee and ride directly into downtown Chicago without having to change trains, change cars, and you could literally walk right off to where you needed to go. It was quite the operation. Now, some people look at this and say, it's not a trolley, it's too big. It really isn't. They used, for some of the line, they used the poles and the overhead wire. And at other times, especially when they were in Chicago, they used the third rail, like we associate with the subways. The conductors, in some spots, had to open that back door and pull the pole down while the car was moving. And oh, by the way, these cars are capable of about 70 miles an hour. Now, the car was built in 1930, and as it got older and older and older, the company realized they needed to, you know, kind of modernize it a little bit. So it's got this beautiful um, stainless steel fluted siding, right? Wrong. It's totally flat. This is a clever paint job. I think in, in some circles they call it trompe l'oeil, or fool the eye. This is all paint. And there's another trolley museum in Chicago, the Illinois Railway Museum, that saved the jig to do this. So hopefully somewhere along the way, maybe we'll have permission to use it. But the car dates to 1930, and it, was look, it looks a lot uh, newer than that. Eric Gilman, who is our motorman today, and, and I should mention Tom Teller, who's sitting in the window, but Eric is our prime sponsor. A lot of people ask us, you know, how do you get the cars restored, how do you get the money? Most of it is internal. One of us or a group of us will prove that there's financial backing to undertake a restoration, and Eric is in the process right now. He has stabilized the car. He's raising funds for its eventual restoration, which will include a complete repaint. This was a much brighter red color in its day but very quick and very fast so ladies and gentlemen from chicago and milwaukee and every place else in between car number 755 now now the folks down there you may want to cover your ears because we can't let it go without it blowing the horn all right and these horns had to be heard a little bit distant so eric let loose <laughs> The people a couple miles down the road now wonder what's coming at them. The gentleman you see running around in the blue shirt and the red hat is Tom LaRoche. He's our parade dispatcher, and it's his job to get the cars down here on time. So we'll, we'll give him a big round of applause at the end. All right, anybody from, Mil uh, from Minneapolis, excuse me? All right, how about St. Paul? All right, this is from both. But this is not done, all right? We, we borrowed this from the restoration shop. This is car 1267. It will eventually have its number back on it. Built in 1907. And Milwaukee, uh, uh, rather, Minneapolis built their cars well. This was built by them. But 
they came up with an interesting design in the back where Richard, our conductor, is standing. Those are folding gates that they, actually the motorman controls with just a, a long arm. And when the car pulled up to your stop, you'd get on here, and Richard would be sitting just inside those back doors where you can see a fare register. So everybody could get on. And the gates would shut, and the car could get going again. And you'd go and pay the conductor, and then you would go sit. Later, in later years, they changed the front to put in a regular front door, but we restored it to the way it looked uh, originally. Now, do we have any like amateur woodworkers like me in the crowd? This car was fully restored in the 1990s, and all the paperwork on it said the matchboard siding is poplar. Right? That's what we used. We put poplar on it. And the next thing we know, the matchboard's all rotting out. Huh? Did a little more research, and we found that modern poplar isn't like old poplar in the way it's, it's grown, it's farm grown. And basically, we had turned the car into a giant wick. It was wicking up moisture. So now what do we do? We went to some woodworking experts in Biddeford, and they recommended cypress. So this is going to be our first car to be out shopped with an outside body made of cypress. And so far, so good. It has a little bit more work to do. They've had to put windows back in. And we're hopeful that by the time our pumpkin patch event comes up in the fall, that this will be back in the fleet. Now, our motorman, Chuck Aronovich, now from Tallahassee, Florida, via New York, and originally from Montreal. And Richard Lane, who's on the back, is from the Dover, New Hampshire area. We thank them very much today. Ladies and gentlemen, from Minneapolis and St. Paul, car number 1267. Seven fifty-five draws a lot of power. If you were looking at the power station right now, you'd see the meters going, and he's going uphill. So we have to kind of give him priority to go back up into the car barn. I know it's not a trolley, but we have to have things that work on the trolleys. What is this menacing thing that's coming over here? Let's see if it's what I think it is. Maybe my music stand isn't what I think it is. <laughs> It's not metal. I mean, it's aluminum. It's not iron. Oh, well. Oh. That doesn't work either. Oh, well. That'll work. Go for it, Tom. All right. I'll tell you what it was when he gets out of the way because it's kind of noisy. Watch the wheels, though, on how it goes. This was a device called a Pettibone Speed Swing. I like to think of it as a Swiss Army knife of railroading. It's like a looks like a front end loader, but it can get up on the rails as you see. And if you watch when he gets back to the road crossing up there, he's actually going to drive off the railroad. But he had the magnet on this afternoon. That thing has a grappling hook, a snow plow, uh, and several other attachments, and it can be used in a lot of places. We can use it out on the road. We can use it on the railroad. And it does a lot of things. So he'll get up onto the road crossing now, and then he retracts the flanged wheels, comes down onto the, he's doing that in the back right now, then he'll lower the front, 
and dr just drive the thing right off the railroad. And it's very handy when we have to get things moved around. Here comes the front. And off he goes. Our operator, Chuck Griffith, retired from the MBTA, and he does a lot of this type of work um, around here with our various power and equipment. If you watch the uh, Minneapolis car, this is something we have to do. We have to back them up from time to time. And on a windy day, it's hard to get the pole up on the wire. We joke about people walking the trolley. It looks like what he's doing right now. Just put, put this here, guys. The reason he's holding the rope, usually when a trolley's moving, the pole is trailing out behind it. When it's forward like that, it can catch on some of the hangers. So you're always holding on to the pole in case something happens. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you look to your left, you're going to see, well, maybe not. That, okay, I'm off by one, Never mind. Actually, look to your right. We have trolleys coming from all different directions today. All right, I'll throw this one out. Anybody here from Australia? Hey, it's worth a shot. This is car 1700. And if you look at the ad, you can see it is indeed from Australia. This is from Sydney. It was built in 1925. Interestingly enough, though, it has all United States-made control components to it. This and its sister cars were used on a very, very popular beach line, and they were made so they could couple together in trains of several cars. And they're unusual because instead of having just benches, they made little compartments. These doors, which are permanently wired open, have folded leather, an accordion-like arrangement. So if it was a cool day, the passengers could close the door. Not so the conductor. The conductor had to walk the running board from compartment to compartment to compartment to collect fares and such, never mind whatever the, the weather was of the day. They're still not using, but there are trams like this still in Sydney. Jeff Bennett, our operator, has been down there, and uh, I have some very nice pictures courtesy of him. The car is not in service right now, but we hope to have it back in the fleet a little bit later on. Whit Coffin, who's our conductor, lives locally now and is one of our weekday dispatchers here at the museum. So ladies and gentlemen, all the way from Sydney, Australia, car number 1700. What we're going to do now is introduce back to the fleet after a many year absence one of our open cars. This is the first time this car has been out in several years. It just was released by the shop this morning. This is car 838 from New Haven, Connecticut, built in 1905. The roof is very typical of what railroad coaches would have been like in the day, so it's said to have a railroad roof. We're going to be bringing another open car in with it, and I'll tell you another part of the story in just a moment. But the car has been in the shop now for several years, undergoing a re-restoration, including being fully repainted. There is an interesting twist with this car. Uh, it is from New Haven, and we, 
we have a gentleman who lives nearby that once lived there and remembered riding these cars when he was a student down there. So we invited him up with his family and gave him a chance to run the car. And Mr. Bush turned out to be a very competent trolley operator. That's George H.W. Bush. And this was the car that he operated that day. Now, coming from the other direction is another car from the same city, from New Haven. And I'll wait till it pulls up to tell you why we have these two out. I'm going to appropriate your sign. One hundred years ago this year, Yale University opened a new athletic facility which would change transit in New Haven for many, many years. Yale Bowl opened in 1914, and college football became the thing. Saturdays were a busy day already in New Haven. People were using the trolleys to go to work. Remember, people worked six days back then, going to shopping, every place else. Now you had, oh, 50, 60, 70,000 extra people coming into New Haven to go to the football games, usually by train, they'd come into the train station, the trolley company was pretty taxed for equipment. They had these open cars. By then, by the fall of the year, they'd be in storage to be ready for the next summer. And I don't know who had the idea, but somebody realized that if people were coming to sit outdoors at a football game in the fall, they would be warmly dressed. So they brought out the open cars and used those to carry a lot of the football crowds. Nick, nickname these the Yale Bowl Fleet. The cars can seat 75 people. We have pictures of as many as 150 people jammed on the seats, stacked on the running boards, even a few idiots riding up on the roof of the car. They'd come down the street and you'd see the car literally tilting because so many people were standing on, on one side of it. But they got the job done, and it was a big deal. You know, there's fads over the years in colleges. How many people can you cram into a phone booth or get into a Volkswagen? I guess this was considered part of that, too. But they got the job done. The last Yale Bowl runs were made in the fall of 1947. And the following year, trolley service ended in New Haven. This and two other open cars came here. 303 here is built in 1901. It's the oldest of the group. And it has been our only car, open car, for the last few years. Mark and um, Lee are doing what the conductor and motorman would normally do at the end of the line. They came from one direction. They're going to go back the other way. So they changed the poles, and now they're flipping the bench seats over. So when people would get on, they'd be all ready to go the other way. This was a very common occurrence back then, probably while the football game was in progress. So we're proud now, as of today, to have the second open car back in the fleet. I'm going to turn the sign on it, though. I'm going to make it the Yale Bowl car, and then we'll send it on its way. But ladies and gentlemen, from New Haven, Connecticut, cars 303 and 838. Incidentally, at the end of the parade, these two opens will be available for rides. Oh, I forgot. Elliot Kaplan, who was our motorman, is our superintendent of railway operations from Newton, Massachusetts. And Keith, our conductor, is one of our new uh, students. And he is from Jefferson, Maine, which is up in the mid-coast. We're going to go back to Boston now. 
This is car number 396, built in 1900. It's typical of an, a passenger car of that time. These would have operated on the streets of Boston, and it was a passenger car for a number of years, but was later converted to a work car, and that's how it came here. And not much happened to it until 1963, when Otto Prebinger, the film director, came calling. He was going to shoot a movie in the greater Boston area called The Cardinal. Perhaps you've seen it. And there was a scene in the movie that required a trolley car. So there were negotiations with us and his production company, Gamma Productions, rented this car, if you will, from us for a dollar. Yes, I said a dollar. And this was trucked down to the shops of the MTA in Boston, and in about eight days, the car was completely restored as a passenger car. The movie scenes were shot on a Sunday afternoon in Belmont, Massachusetts, and then the car was returned to us. It's only in the movie for a few moments. There's some outside scenes, and there are some scenes that were shot inside the car, but it's our movie star car. It was used again in the 1970s by the Children's Television Workshop for a program they did at the time. It's been back at our shop recently, and among the things we've restored were the signs. And it's a four-sided sign. The motorman would use a little wooden pole to turn it to whatever the correct destinations were. And I don't want to uh, step on our parade uh, dispatcher's uh, good nature here, but I'm going to have Glenn move the car just a smudge to show something. Glenn, will you move and watch Glenn's right hand? Okay, now stop it, Glenn. Okay. All the cars you've seen up till now had air brakes. This is an old car. The early cars had hand-operated brakes. That's that gooseneck lever. Those motormen of that day must have had enormous right arms because it's physical. He has to stop the car only with the force of his arm, and you feel it after a while. You notice it's open on the end. The poor motorman was outside. Didn't matter what time of year or what the weather conditions were. It was only after some motorman died that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts passed laws that forced the trolley lines to close in the vestibule so the motorman had protection. So ladies and gentlemen, from Boston, Massachusetts, our movie star car, the Cardinal car, number 396. All right, we'll try again. Anybody in the audience from the Cleveland area today? All right. This is number 1227. Tiny, isn't it? At 51 feet long, this is the longest streetcar in our collection. Cleveland had an interesting situation. In a lot of the cities, I'll use Boston as an example because that's the area that I grew up with. If you took the trolley in from the suburbs, the chances are somewhere along the way, you transfer to something bigger, like the subway or the elevated cars, and then the trolley would turn back the way it came. That wasn't the case for the longest while in Cleveland. The trolleys had to run directly from the suburbs right into the core of the city. So they had to build the cars to handle those crowds. This car was built 100 years ago, and it's big now, but at rush hour, they had a fleet of what were known as trailer cars. They looked almost like this and were almost as big that would be coupled on and pulled along by the powered car up front. So imagine that size train of cars coming down the street. Now, in this type of car, you see that each door has a marked entrance and exit. Cliff, who's the conductor, would sit on this very uncomfortable little wooden stool that's right in the middle of the doorway. The conductors didn't rate, in the morning, didn't rate any creature comforts. Thank you. And he'd collect your fare as you went in or as you left, but that was his position. 
Cliff Sargent, our conductor, is from uh, the greater Boston area, a longtime member here. Peter Hammond, who's our motorman, is from Norway, Maine, and uh, now retired as both a bus driver and school teacher in, in that particular order. Now, this car has not been put into our fleet yet. They're finishing up on the restoration. What you can't see on the other side is a smokestack. The car had a coal-fired heater on the inside of it. And they've just put the smokestack on, and we're hopeful that later this year, the car will be finally dedicated and then released to our fleet, because it can hold a lot of people. So ladies and gentlemen, from Cleveland, car number 1227. Our next car is from West Virginia. Anybody from that neck of the woods? All right. This is number 639 from Wheeling. It dates to 1924. And this is what would have been known in the industry at the time as a cookie cutter car. If you were a trolley company and you needed new equipment, you could go to a builder and have them design a brand new car just for your line. Or you could go to a builder and say, what do you have? This type of curved design was a very basic design at the time, as it was for wheeling. This car went through an amazing transformation. It was very common in those days when trolley lines either went out of business or got new equipment. They would either sell cheaply or give away the car bodies. When you think about it, this is a building, right? It's got windows and doors. It's got a roof to keep you dry. This car ended up as part of a doctor's office and dispensary in the town of Little Hawking, Ohio. When it came back here to Maine, about all that was left of it that resembled a trolley car were the four sides, the four ends. And I don't want to embarrass him, but our board chairman, Jim Shantz, who spoke to you earlier this afternoon, undertook the not just restoration, but basically the reconstruction of this car, a process that took over 35 years in a series of steps. We've collected spare parts over the years, seats, things like that. We were able to rebuild the car using new, new construction and other parts that were on hand. The trucks and motors, incidentally, are from Boston cars, so there are several cities represented here. Our motorman today is Rob Gingell. I'll go into this a little bit more. We are all volunteers. We do this not for pay. We do this sort of as a hobby. Rob visits us every year, several times a year, from the south. Rob, could you just give them a little sample of your southern accent, please? <laughs> My southern accent, actually, uh, I can advertise Geico Insurance on the side. Thank you. Rob is originally from England, but now living in Georgia and North Carolina, so we kid him about his, his unusual accent. And his conductor is David Gohegan, another member of our team. So ladies and gentlemen, from Wheeling, West Virginia, via Little Hawking, Ohio, in Kenny Bunkport, Maine, number 639. <laughs> Incidentally, have you noticed kind of a common theme in the color? A lot of bright yellows and bright oranges. Why do you think that was done? So you could see it, right? By this time, by the 1920s, there's a lot of automobile traffic in the streets competing with the trolleys. And if somebody ever said, I never saw that bright orange thing coming at me, you know, the officer wouldn't, wouldn't pay attention. So that's the reason why you see a lot of the cars from this period are painted in the very, very bright colors, at least on part of them. All right, we're going to go down south now. 
Any folks from Texas here? Usually when the Secret Service detail is in town, we'll get a little response on the Texas. <laughs> this is car number 434. Like the Cleveland car, this car is 100 years old this year, built in 1914. There were a number of transit lines in the United States that were owned by Stone and Webster. Today we recognize that name as a very well-known engineering firm, but they also own some transit lines. And this was designed with the idea of being cheap to build, easy to run, comfortable, somewhat comfortable. The noted part of this is its roof. The roof looks like this. Okay. And children kind of know this. It reminds people of a certain animal. What animal, a very slow moving animal, has this kind of a body? A turtle, right? So this car has a turtle roof, right? It act, for those of you that are into engineering, it transfers the weight to the sides and then down the sides of the car. We have volunteers at Seashore that often are family members. And our motorman and conductor today are son and father, both named John Patillo, both from Massachusetts. We thank them for their participation. Now, we've preserved the history that goes along with these cars, and you can't see inside number 434 right now. But if you could, above every seat, there's a little metal bracket that looks like something should go in there. And indeed, in the day, something did go in one of those brackets. It was a little sign. The sign had four words on it. White, forward, colored, rear. Dallas had a segregated transit system the entire time that this car was in operation. Where you sat on the trolley car was determined only by the color of your skin. And that sign could be positioned depending on the type of passengers and the quantity they expected to have. Interesting note, a few years back, we had a group of elementary school students do a work project here. Maine, honestly, is about 98% white. And in a little follow-up survey, they were asked a question. Should we put the sign back in the car? And what do you think the response was? 100% of those boys and girls said yes, that we should do it. Haven't done it yet, but we will. So, ladies and gentlemen, from Dallas, Texas, car number 434D. We have another 434, but this is the one from Dallas. I lost one thought there. The car came here in 1954, so I like to think, well, I like to realize now that it has run far many more desegregated miles in Maine that it ever ran as a segregated car in Texas. All right, we're going to go back to the Windy City for a minute, to Chicago. Chicago had a huge transit system. And this was one little part of it. You had the, the trolley cars on the streets. You had the elevated cars. They had cable cars in Chicago for a long time. Don't, many people don't know that. This car, number 225, was built in 1908, and there were hundreds of these cars plying the streets of Chicago. Said better, if you were running up the street to catch the trolley car and it left just before you got there, you would have to stand there waiting for the next trolley for 30 whole seconds. That's how quick the cars came and went. The management was so focused on making the cars move that for a while anyway, the rules said if the last person getting on the car was a woman, 
The conductor had to wait till she was completely in the vestibule before he gave the signal to go. But if the last person getting on was a man, as long as he had one foot on the step, they could go. So go they went. This car uh, underwent a restoration. I give up on my notes there. Don't worry about that card that's flying around. That's really nothing. It's this book that I need. This car underwent a restoration uh, a number of years back. We unfortunately are having some electrical difficulties with it, and it cannot run in regular service, but it was okay to bring it out today. They were known for the fact that they were noisy and that they were bright red. So, ladies and gentlemen, from Chicago, the Red Rattler, car number 225. All right, there she goes. If you were 106 years old, you might be a little slow going at times yourself. While we have a moment, I want to go back to something I said in brief a moment ago. Everybody that you see doing something in conjunction with the parade this afternoon, whether it's somebody running the car or someone helping on the ground here is a volunteer all right we could be doing something else on a saturday afternoon but this is what we do as a hobby but also to preserve a way of life the trolleys made it possible for people to get around and made it possible for people to live somewhere outside of the city thank you very much yeah. We're always looking for more help. Volunteers do a lot here, not just operate the trolley cars, painting buildings, mowing lawns, working in the restoration shop. So the, especially those of you that live locally, we could certainly use more help. You can find out information about membership in the visitor center and also on our website, trolleymuseum.org. We could certainly use more of you. All right, anybody in the audience today from the Baltimore area? Oh, okay. Yeah. One. All right, from Baltimore, this is number 6144. This is a product of the 1920s, well, actually the late 20s, I believe, 1929 or 1930. And it's a car that was called in the trolley business a Peter Witt type. It was na named for the gentleman, actually a gentleman associated with the city of Cleveland, who designed a type of car that could be loaded quickly and the passengers handled well. The passengers entered by the front door and then left through the middle one. The conductor actually sat near that middle door and collected the fares as the people went out. The idea was to speed it up, get people on and go. Uh, if you look at it, it's starting to be streamlined. This is about 10 years before the Washington car you saw a few minutes ago. So they're just starting to get the idea of streamlining and making it look good and making it run fast. And this car does indeed run fast. We have volunteers at the Trolley Museum who come from as close as Arundel. I don't know if our, if our representative is still here, but I'm, I'm an Arundelite, formerly from Massachusetts. But operating the car today is the gentleman who I believe came the farthest. Two days ago, he was on an airplane headed here. Jeremy Whiteman is from San Francisco, California, and he comes here at least once a year, now a couple of times a year. I'm embarrassing you to death, but uh, he's done without a lot of sleep in the last couple of days to be with us, and he helped set up the parade today. Oh, do we lose the power again? It happens. Yeah, you got it. Since we brought up the subject of San Francisco, Jeremy is in a hotbed 
of transit because San Francisco has everything. We all think of the cable cars, but there's a lot of other stuff going on there, including a whole fleet of the, the type of car we saw from Washington, the PCC car, a whole fleet that was originally thought of, oh, it'll be popular with the tourists and that's it. And all of a sudden they discovered the local people use it probably more heavily than the tourists. So he's involved out there with some of the activities uh, with San Francisco. Now the pole goes back up on the wire. It's hard on a windy day because even the wire gets moving around. So when ready, ladies and gentlemen, from Baltimore, car number 6144. vehicles, plural, will be coming at us while we have the time. The same year that the trolley line opened through here between Kennebunkport and Biddeford, which was 1904, something marvelous happened in the city of Boston. If you lived in East Boston, which is the side of the harbor where Logan Airport is located, you could ride the trolleys everywhere. But if you wanted to go from East Boston into downtown Boston, you'd have to get off the trolley, take a ferry boat across the harbor, then get on another trolley car downtown. Kind of inconvenient, and it made for a long trip. It was that year that a tunnel was finished underneath Boston Harbor. Today we hear Boston Tunnel, we think Sumner Tunnel, Callahan Tunnel, Ted Williams Tunnel, the tunnels we drive through. But it was the trolley tunnel that opened first. Oh, are we out of order? Okay. All right, we have a moment of confusion as to what's coming. Can we do the city of Manchester without messing everything up? All right, we're going to shift gears. I'll get back to my Boston story in a minute. Anybody from the Manchester, New Hampshire area? All right. This is one of the most unusual cars in our collection. It's just so delicate. This is the city of Manchester. This was the official car for the Manchester, New Hampshire Street Railway. The car was built in 1898 in Amesbury, Massachusetts. Some of the earliest builders of trolley cars were carriage companies, and Amesbury was home to the Briggs Carriage Company, and they built this car. This was the private car for the trolley line. They'd use it for taking visiting dignitaries around the city. Private groups could rent the car. They had wicker furniture. If it was nice, they'd put it out on these porches. They had little canvas curtains to keep the sun out. If the weather was not so good, they'd go inside. You can't see it well from out here, but there's mahogany cabinet work on the inside. It's like corner cabinets everywhere you look, and we understand in the day some of those cabinets would have been stocked with some potent portables to entertain the dignitaries who were visiting the town. Trolleys have multiple lives. In the early 1950s, the car was found by one of our members. His name was Malcolm Buston. It was found on a farm in New Hampshire. B. 
being used as a playhouse for the children of the farmer. He had acquired the body, and it was sitting in his property. Mr. Buston bought the body and donated it to the museum, and the car was completely restored as it would have looked in the day. Some of you who may have come here on Saturdays, the last, oh, 10 years or so, at some point on a Saturday, a hunched over little man would appear in ordinary street clothes, but with a conductor's cap, always with a CNA or somebody taking care of him. He was coming in from a rest home. And he'd be hunched over, but he'd go for the trolley car. That was Mr. Buston. He passed away last fall at the ripe young age of 97. And we are forever indebted to him for finding this treasure, which we've been able to bring back to its original form as a trolley car. So ladies and gentlemen, from the, the city of Manchester, New Hampshire, the city of Manchester. It's another one that's run just with hand brakes. Jack Nogler, our operator, has to use the hand brakes. Jack is from New Hampshire as well. It just seems inconceivable that something like that was rotting away in the weeds with children playing through it. But things like that happened. The old bodies of the trolley cars became everything. Chicken coops, uh, starter homes. All right, seriously, we had a gentleman in a few years ago from uh, New Hampshire who started tearing into the walls of his house to do a renovation, and he's looking at the body of a trolley car. The trolley had become the, the original form for the house. So the bodies were used many times over in many different applications. We have to wait for the city to cross over. So I'll go back to my Boston story because I know what's coming now. When that tunnel opened underneath Boston Harbor, somebody could now get on a trolley car in East Boston, travel underneath the harbor, right into downtown Boston, and then eventually, when things were added, right up back up onto the west end of Boston and over into Cambridge. People's world suddenly expanded because they didn't have to worry about that ferry boat ride. They could just get on the trolley car, go through the tunnel, right into downtown. A few years after that, the, the system was changed from streetcars like the Cardinal car, that type of thing, to subway cars, or what we think of as rapid transit. And here comes a train from that line. The fact that the, tr that the tunnel was built for trolley cars has meant that every single subway car that has followed has had to be shorter, narrower, tinier than all of the other subway cars in Boston to fit through the tunnel. These cars, numbers 622 and 623, were built in 1978 to replace cars on the blue line in Boston that were 50 and approximately 25 years old. They were flawed from the first day, and their bodies started to rot out. It's interesting, the first set of subway cars on that line lasted 50 years. The next group lasted 25 plus. These lasted barely over 20. When the MBTA was going to replace them, it thought about possibly rebuilding some of these cars to use elsewhere on the system. This was the test set. This set was sent out and fully rebuilt. And we're glad to have it because of its condition. Dick Pascucci, who's at the north end there, who's one of our longtime members, is now an inspector and instructor with the MBTA. He's taught us and, and the folks in Boston how to operate cars like this. And up at the front, Where's our, there you are. All right, that's Brian Tenalia, our, our motorman. 
these are the first set of uh, subway cars that we're using in regular service here. We have all had to go through training, even some of us that have been in service for a while. And I have my, I have my key to the train, so I'm one of the operators. So there are even newer cars running on this line today. We won't make any comments about how long we think those will last. The ladies and gentlemen from Boston, Massachusetts, cars 622 and 623, Blue Line Trade. It talks. We have to put poles on our subway equipment. This line used both uh, third rail and some overhead wire. All right, we are going to bring down now, and it's going to take a moment to do this. We're going to bring down three cars because they all have a connection. I'll just let them come down, and then I'm going to tell you what they're about. <laughs> The common theme here is working on the railroad. We're actually going to start on this end. The car that's pulling up, locomotive number 300, is about 20 years newer than the locomotive 100 you saw earlier in the parade. But the idea is the same, an electric locomotive that would have been used particularly to haul freight cars. This car was built in 1920 in Philadelphia by Balding Westinghouse. But the line for which it was built defaulted and the car was sold to Oshawa, Ontario, where it was in heavy use all of its life. We use it to move cars that can't move under its, by their own power. And uh, there's a lot of that in the collection. And the car can be very fine. It looks like this big thing that would be tough to, to navigate, but it can actually do some very, very fine moving. Some of you know, because of the way the parade was promoted, that I make my living in broadcasting. I'm not the only one. Uh, anybody here from the greater New York City area? Sir, could you tell us uh, what we could expect weather-wise tomorrow? It's going to be a beautiful day to come back to the Seashore Trial Museum. Warm, increasingly humid, with temperatures near 80. I'm meteorologist Todd Glickman in the WCBS Weather Center. He won it one day, and I recognized who he was, and I let him run a trolley car. We haven't been able to get rid of him. No, he actually, he actually plays a key role. And Derek Carter, who's our uh, conductor on 300, also another longtime member from the Boston area and a part of our weekend crew. So ladies and gentlemen from Oshawa, Ontario, locomotive 300. While they're moving, we're gonna go back to Boston for a minute. I'm not predicting, and neither is Todd, any freezing weather, but here's our snow plow. This is car 5106, but this was originally built in the early part of the 20th century as a passenger car. A, you saw a Type 5 earlier in the parade. This was a Type 3. Later, a whole bunch of them were converted to plow snow. This car has four plow blades on it. There's a V-plow on each end, and that, that doesn't move. That's always there, and that would force the snow to one either side of the car. In the middle is a big shear plow. There's an air piston in the car, and the operator could raise and lower this 
almost like you, know, you take a knife and you very nicely do the frosting on the cake. This pushes it off to the side. And then the, the real serious plow is the wing plow. This would swing, it's on a pivot, it swings off like this, and they could lower it to, well, clear the sidewalks, clear the car stops, whatever they needed to clear. There are stories from the Boston area that sometimes the late night patrons at some of the watering holes would be warned that their parked cars were in the way of snow removal operations and, you know, wanted to wait for a last call so they'd come out and find that the trolley had been an excellent can opener and was taken <laughs> off the sides of their cars courtesy of that wind plow. Now, this is another vehicle that we use to move cars that can't be run under their own power. We've used this a lot to get some of the stuff ready for the parade. Ed Dukes, who is the motorman today, is a very active volunteer, again talking the media connection. He is the retired chief cinematographer for WBZ TV Channel 4 in Boston. Uh, you've seen a lot of Seashore's uh, television and public service announcements over the years. Ed probably shot some of the video for it. So ladies and gentlemen from Boston, our, one of our snow plows, cars, num car number 5106. And finally, we'll go down here. They had to have a way of working on stuff. That complicated word. This is car 3283 from Boston. It's a line car. That tower that's up on the roof can be cranked up and down, and it can also swing off to either side of the car. So if they needed to work on the overhead wire, they could climb up and do it. The tower is made of wood and the car has a canvas roof, so the workman could actually reach up and grab the wire, the live wire barehanded, and not be electrocuted because he wasn't grounded. It was protected. There's an interesting story with this car. The Boston Elevated Railway, which was the transit line back then, put out a bid for this type of car, and one bid from a company that only made lines so they were delivered a body. They had to put the rest of the car together uh, to finish it out. We use it now the way it was intended to be work to work rather on our overhead wire, the poles next to it, and sometimes even on some of the buildings nearby. Our operator today is Chester Gabriel. Um, was a member here for a long time. Made the mistake of moving to Florida for a few years. Now he's back in in West Kennebunk. And Jake Foley, who is the conductor and electrician in whatever role he would want to be, is from Massachusetts. He is active in our, our other operation, which is at Paul. So ladies and gentlemen, from Boston, car number 3283, our line car. told by Tom, um, someone has reported having lost a set of keys. So if everybody in your travels this afternoon can kind of look around, if you find them, just drop them in to the folks at the store, and that's our de facto lost and found, and uh, they would be more than happy to be reunited with their keys. All right, we have a little bit more. First, we have to put the this car away. tell you about one set that can't move, and that's what they're going by right now. They're very modern looking, what look like subway cars, the SOAC cars. In the early 1970s, the federal government sponsored the building of a, of a set of cars to test out all kinds of new things that were developing in the transit business, new types of propulsion and braking. They, they were called the state of the art cars, or SOAC, S-O-A-C. And when the government was done with them, uh, we were able to acquire them on the, well, I guess the arrangement was they had to be put on display. So they're there. Um, they're not operable at this time, but some of the systems and all that were used on those cars made their way into other types of transit equipment that was built around that time. Those cars ran in several US cities, including Boston and New York. 
And if you've ever ridden Boston's Red Line, you may have ridden on those in the early 70s when they came here. All right, we're actually going to bring down two more cars together. And they have an unusual reason for coming together. So we'll wait for them to come down here. The first car that's coming down is one that's been very popular here over the years, and it has been out of service for as best as we can tell eight, maybe nine years. And today it is just about ready to come back into our operating fleet, and I'll tell you more about it when it gets here. Car 4387. Anybody from the greater Boston area, particularly north of Boston, uh, Okay. Oh, yes, Tom, we know you're... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. 4387 and 4547. Don't take my trolley car away, Tom. It's from my home. I grew, I'm originally from Salem, Massachusetts, and that would have been my hometown line. This is 4547 from Brooklyn, New York. Do we have any Brooklynites in the, in the crowd today? All right, we'll leave it here, Tim. The trolley companies were always innovating, and they had a big problem at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries. Many lines, many companies had open cars for the summertime, but you can't use an open car in a snowstorm. So they'd have to have a set of closed cars for the winter. That was very expensive. It would be like you having to have two automobiles to get through a whole year, or four if you're a two-car household. So designers went to work. Could they come up with a car that could be good in all seasons? This is a convertible. The top doesn't come down. But here's what happens. The windows came off. In the summertime, they took the window panels out and they were replaced by these steel safety grates so nobody would fall out. And when they did that, the car was nice, wide open. It caught the breezes as it went along. Nice idea, right? Brooklyn had hundreds of trolley cars. Where do you put all those windows? And what happens if it's a nice morning and the car's out on the line and then the weather turns sour? You don't have the windows right there to put back in. So this was good. Could they get better? Yes, they could. This is the convertible. This is called a semi-convertible. And now we're gonna do a little demonstration here. I can catch up to my crew. All right. Oh, can we open one? All right. I see what we're doing. It's a three-part window. Alan has rolled the, the middle section. It goes up into a pocket between the ceiling of the car and the roof. Let's show them what happens with the bottom sash. What looks like the window sill is a trap door the window's been hiding down here. So let's put it up. And it would lock into place as these are. So in a hot weather like today, they'd have the car all opened up. But if a sudden storm came up or it got chilly, they could close the window selectively. In the wintertime, both cars had electric heat, so it would be nice and toasty warm. And this was truly a car that could be used easily in all four seasons of the year. There's one other little piece to this one. 4387 was on the Eastern Massachusetts Street Railway's last north of Boston line, which ran between the Sullivan Square Elevated Station in Charlestown to Stoneham, Massachusetts, through a very beautiful public park area known as the Middlesex Fells Reservation. After the last public trolley trip, there was one more, and visiting dignitaries and people from the town all took part in that. The motorman on that run 
was a trolley museum member by the name of Lester Stevenson. And since he was an employee of the company, he mm, kind of greased the skids, I guess, and made it possible for this car to come to Maine about a year after it came out of service in the greater Boston area. The car has been restored once already. We've just finished another little re-restoration on it. I'd like to introduce the crew today. Our motorman is Lester Stevenson, <laughs> Jr. Lester is the son of the gentleman who got this trolley car. What we had hoped to do today was to have another person on this car, Donald Stevenson, Lester's son, but he had to end up having to work today, and his children are also volunteers here. So you figure it out, we got one, two, three, four generations of one family that have been involved here and continue their involvement. And I thought it was important that we have Lester uh, be the motorman on, on the car today. So ladies and gentlemen, from the Eastern Massachusetts Street Railway, car number 4387. You guys can go. I'm not done with 4547. Going back to Brooklyn for a minute. Trolleys were very popular. They were in all the big cities. They were so popular, the streets were packed with trolley cars. I mean, they can't exactly pull out and pass each other on tracks. So the streets are full, the trolleys are going every which way. So much so, it kind of was a challenge to cross the street, all right? So the saying in Brooklyn anyway was, you couldn't cross a street in Brooklyn without having to dodge a trolley. And now you know how a professional baseball team got its name. The do you ever wonder, what were the Dodgers dodging? Okay. The Brooklyn Dodgers were originally known as the Brooklyn Trolley Dodgers. The word trolley got dropped there along the way. Well, the Brooklyn got dropped along the way too, but that's another thing. So trolleys not only carried people, they were also responsible for something as simple as the naming of a baseball team. Our motorman up there, Tim Spear, is originally from New York City, now living in the greater Boston area. And Mike Peters, who's our conductor, is from Dracut, Massachusetts. Well, originally, you, you want to give them a sample of your Dracut accent? No, that's okay. I'll pass. Mike is also originally from England. But. So, ladies and gentlemen, from Brooklyn, New York, car number 4547. I'm going to let, just let that stay there. Gave up on that a long time ago. I'll tell you, this is a lot better. We were here yesterday trying to, the, the big plan was to get all the trolleys assembled and everything yesterday. Not, we were here at 7 o'clock this morning, you know, ringing things out, trying to put everything together. So I'd rather have this kind of weather than what we had uh, yesterday and, and earlier in the week. All right, we have done this parade to not only celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Trolley Museum, but also to welcome back into the fleet probably the most popular car in our collection. I can't tell you how many visitors have asked about one particular car, the Golden Chariot, Montreal car number two, which has been out of service for many, many seasons now, um, suffering from some electrical difficulties, some mechanical difficulties, and eventually some of the uh, weather uh, took its toll on the woodwork of the car. So ladies and gentlemen, we are going to bring down car number two right now. When it arrives, I'll tell you its story, but I'll let those of you with cameras and all take some great pictures as number two comes down the line here. The Golden Chariot, its first appearance in many years on our railroad. And car two has had a whoops. But it came out of the whoops. <laughs> 
Montreal had four of these observation cars. This is car two of the four, built in 1906. And these were built for sightseeing. Look at the way the seats are done. It's like a movie theater. One behind the other. You had a good view as you went along. Now, the idea was to be, I guess, a touristy kind of thing. You'd pay for the, for the uh, observation tour. But it didn't take Montrealers long to realize that in a day before air conditioning, on a hot summer night, this was a heck of a way to cool off. Right? Because the car not only made its own breezes as it went along, but because there's no body over it, you caught the wind from any direction. So people would ride the car just to cool off. As I said, it was built in 1906, and eventually there were four cars built. And this is one of the most satisfying facts about this. All four of the observation cars were saved. We have number two. Car four is at the Connecticut Trolley Museum in Windsor Locks, and cars one and three are at Expo Rail, the Canadian Railway Museum outside of Montreal. It's very unusual that a whole series of cars like that were saved. They're all done, they're all preserved. Now, number two's been out of service for a, a bit, and the shop guys have been working hard on it. I would like to publicly mention the names of two gentlemen who are volunteers. Now, we had a lot of guys that worked on the car, I don't know if they're anywhere in, one is anywhere in sight, but Richard Avey. Oh, where are you? Oh, you're over there. Will you stand up, please, Dick? And another gentleman from Arundel by the name of Jim Mackle. Now, Jim went in the hospital this morning, unfortunately, and uh, we hope he's doing okay. Each of those men, between last November and today, each contributed over 1,000 hours of volunteer time in the restoration of car number two. Now, there were other individuals that helped on the car, but they did the lion's share of the work. Dick's wife, Judy, is also with him. Chuck's on the car, our resident Montrealer. Chelsea Pino, I'm going to embarrass Chelsea. She started the work on the seats of this car many, many, many years back. Donald Curry is our lead restoration technician. Donald has been a part of this museum since the early 1950s and is responsible for several of the restoration projects. Yeah, Tom's going to add something. To further embarrass Chelsea, when she was about 12, 13, I'm not sure, I won't tell you her age because ladies don't like, it, like you to know how old they are, but uh, she was walking around collecting early donations to this car with a slot in the top of a jar. Somebody made the mistake of folding up a 10, say, I'll give you a five, putting the 10 in, thinking he'd give, she'd give her a five back. She said, sorry, I don't give change. Professional fundraiser in the making. I'm going to embarrass one other person here. John Middleton is our motorman on the car. John does all sorts of volunteer work for this museum, not just as an operator. He's been a dispatcher. He's been a vice president of the, of the museum. Um, he functions, if you ever take the Down Easter, John is one of the train hosts on the Down Easter. He's involved with the um, Narrow Gauge Railroad up in Portland and a number of other things. John, I'm going to really embarrass you. <clears throat> Would you kindly tell the audience what birthday is coming up this fall? Yeah, just take a good look and then drool. I'm celebrating my 89th birthday the end of September this year. I say that for a reason. We have a joke among all of us here. When we're coming to do something here, we say, yep, I'm going for my electric therapy. <laughs> and it's true. We have so, I've seen so many people come through the museum who are of an older age. And just doing things and being active has kept them going. John can put us to shame sometimes, bounding off some of the cars. So I wanted to just point that out. He's done so much. Uh, I don't think I'm missing anybody in, in the thank yous. I hope, I hope not. Um, what we're going to do right after the parade is I believe we have some special visitors who will take the first ride on number two, but we'll have other rides available later in the afternoon. This is not the end of the parade. We have another car to go. But ladies and gentlemen, back into the fleet after a many-year absence. Numero deux, number two from Montreal. 
Hmm? Yes, I saw that. And we railed at the same time. My heart was in the Watch what's coming behind you. All right. This is the weekend of the nation's birthday. And we have two traditions with our trolley parades. The first is that car 31, the mother car, always leads. Bringing up the end is the Liberty Bell. This is car 1030 of the Lehigh Valley Transit Company. This trolley company ran between Allentown, Pennsylvania and the outskirts of the Philadelphia subway system. The car was built and originally ran in a line in the Midwest, so it actually ended up in Pennsylvania secondhand. It was originally outfitted as a parlor car with very comfortable seating. I don't know, we've been able to bring one of the seats up to the front? Yeah, we have. Some of you can see the, the burnt orange upholstered seats. There are several of those, singles and doubles. There are tables and lamps. It's like riding in your living room. This car arrived in Pennsylvania in 1941. And after World War II started, they needed every bit of passenger carrying capacity they could muster. So the parlor furnishings were junked and regular type bus seats were put in and that's the way it came here. In the 1970s, the car was rehabilitated for our nation's bicentennial. The parlor furniture was duplicated or the old pieces reupholstered and we see the car as it would have looked in Pennsylvania in the early 40s. Now our conductor, Ron Riddell, who's holding the seat, is from that area and Ron has just concluded writing a very wonderful book on the history of the Lehigh Valley. It has not been published yet but it will soon and I had, I've seen a draft and I would encourage people to consider buying that book. Behind him is our mortarman Roger Summers. Roger is our uh, manager of operations, trustee, and you saw earlier the Connecticut company car number 1160. He is, was the prime mover on the restoration of that car. Now, there was one thing about these cars that was legendary. They traveled city streets, they traveled along the highway, they traveled through open countryside, and they needed to let people know they were coming. If you thought 755 had a loud horn, this guy is worse. So the people, I'm not kidding now, the people who are directly in front of the car, you may want to cover your ears, but we can't let this car go without hearing the horn. Let <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, from Allentown, Pennsylvania, the Liberty Bell car number 1030. While they're getting it ready to go back, I forgot one part of the story. There's actually one other bit of history, and that's underneath the car. A very similar series of cars was built for another line in the Midwest, and that line, at one point as a publicity stunt, staged a race between a trolley car and a biplane and the trolley won that trolley also came to allentown when we came to get the liberty bell its motors had already been given or sold to another company and we were offered another set of trucks and motors so the trucks and motors under the car are from the car that raced the biplane so we actually have two bits of transit history preserved in one car I almost forgot to mention that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is pretty much the end of the parade. I want to thank all of the museum volunteers that helped out today. I have a list that Todd doesn't have, uh, that Scott doesn't have. Uh, my name is Tom. I want to thank you all for attending. I especially want to thank uh, my yard, my soil crew. Uh, some of them are operating cars, you've already heard their name, but the people you haven't seen, out in Highwood Yard, John Arico, Central Yard, Bob Perkins, Riverside, uh, Eric Gilman, James Elliott's running some switches, Dick Viscucci down. There's a whole bunch of switches on that end of the railroad that uh, Rob Dry 
Dick Vescucci and James Elliott have been operating. I want to thank them for an excellent job because what Scott didn't tell you is he got the parade in a different order than he asked for it because we had a car failure that was fixed in the middle of the parade. So my ground crew was dealing with all that. And they dealt with it very well. Now we have to kind of put things back, so it's going to take a few minutes to do that.